Okay, let me see if I can find out how to um, do the uh, do this Sharing. properly. Uh, share screen. Uh, share screen. Um, advanced portion of screen. Share. There you okay. go. So, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to participate in this um, uh, series of. Uh, presentations um let's see so i re have received funding from biotech pharmacal in fayetteville arkansas a supplier of vitamin d and other supplements uh, as I mentioned i have a phd in physics and i have studied health since 1996 resulting in 324 publications on solar uvb and vitamin d and 54 regarding diet these publications included articles, uh, reviews, editorials, and letters to the editor. So the outline for today is, um, first of all, vitamin D physiology, then types of studies used to uh, find out how something like vitamin D affects health outcomes. Then the health outcomes I want to discuss include cancers, infectious diseases, pregnancy outcomes, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and autoimmune diseases. Then, of course, there are some concerns about um, uh, sunlight exposure and vitamin D supplementation. And at the end, I'll have recommendations uh, for how to get the best, most out of vitamin D and sun exposure. So in terms of the vitamin D physiology, Vitamin D3 is produced in the skin by solar UVB radiation that's from 320, 290 to 315 nanometers, hitting 7 dehydrocholesterol in the skin, followed by thermal reaction. So this UVB radiation represents, uh, during the middle of the day, 3 to 5% of the total UV, UV, which means it's much less than 1% of total solar radiation. It, so once the vitamin D is produced, it enters the blood and in the liver, it receives a hydroxyl group to become 25 hydroxyvitamin D or calcidiol. Now this is the metabolite measured as uh, for the vitamin D level when you have your blood drawn. But um, that's not an active uh, metabolite. Is uh, When it receives another hydroxyl uh, in the kidneys or other organs, it becomes 125 dihydroxyvitamin D or calcitriol, and that's the active uh, hormone, uh, active version of, of vitamin D, and the hormonal one. Uh, the uh, turns out that as as organs and cells need the calcitriol, they can convert the 25 hydroxyvitamin D to calcitriol, so that the if you had this helps maintain calcitriol levels at a, the proper level for helping to regulate um, serum, uh, calcium, and other uh, things. So here's just a schematic. Uh, you see in the upper left, the, um, the vitamin D production and sources goes to the liver. Um, and then the, the, the what's called a pro-hormone, the 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And... <clears throat> The um, the in the yellow um, circle, uh, you see the the effects, um, the benefits of vitamin D in, in affecting disease such as cancer and um, and other things, and then the in the lower left you see the effect on bones and um, calcium absorption. Uh, the until about the year two thousand. Uh, vitamin D was primarily thought of as, as very important for bones, reducing the risk of rickets, um, and, and, and maintaining proper calcium levels in the blood. But it, it, but it wasn't until about 2000 when uh, work really started to accelerate in finding all the other health benefits of vitamin D. And as a result, this is only 23 years or so, after the big push on vitamin D, we're still learning about the effects of vitamin D and um, they're not fully uh, 
accepted by the, the medical system. So calcitriol exerts many biological activities by regulating transcriptional activation and or repression of target genes. In order to achieve this, calcitriol binds to the vitamin D receptor that's a nuclear transcription factor that's present in almost all tissues. Thus, it is a hormone. Hormones can help control how cells and organs function. It was named the vitamin because when it was discovered around 1922, uh, they had discovered vitamin A, vitamin C, uh, vitamin E. Uh, well, anyway, and they just thought that this was a um, uh, another simple hormone, but um, it's now quite well understood that it's, it's, it's a hormone but they retain the name uh, vitamin D. Um, now, there are both genomic uh, and non-genomic actions of vitamin D. Um, so we just, just discussed the genomic uh, effects. And the non-genomic ones are when the vitamin D re receptor induces rapid signaling uh, situated on the cell membrane and or cytoplasm. Emerging evidence supports the notion that vitamin D enhances immunity, providing protection towards pathogens, while con con concomitantly it exerts immunosuppressive effects by preventing the detrimental effects of prolonged inflammatory responses to the host. Um, this is another schematic. Um, on the left, you have the genetic uh, regulation, and on the right, you have the um, non-genomic uh, regulation. Uh, I've dealt mainly with the genetic effects, and that's what I'll be discussing primarily today. So here's a demonstration that vitamin D affects gene expression. This is an experiment reported in 2019. Uh, 30 healthy adults were randomized to receive 600, 4,000, or 10,000 international units of vitamin D3 for six months. A plateau in the parathyroid hormone levels was achieved at 16 month weeks in the 4,000 and 10,000 IU per day groups. There was a dose-dependent 25-hydroxyvitamin D alteration in broad gene expression with 162, 320, and 1,289 genes up or down-regulated in their white blood cells, respectively. It is now known that, that vitamin D affects maybe 5% of the um, the total uh, genome of the, of the body, um, so it's it's very important. Uh, it's also been shown that there's a, a large variation in gene expression between summer and winter. Now, that could be due to changes in vitamin D. It could also be due to to photoperiod changes, uh, length of the day. It could also be due to changes in temperature. Uh, not clear, but uh, but anyway, the, it's important that vitamin D does do a lot of its work through affecting gene expression. So the sources of vitamin D. Uh, prim primary, primary source for many people is solar UVB. Uh, but you can only make vitamin D when the solar elevation angle is greater than 45 degrees. Now, there's a shadow rule. Uh, the dermatologists say if your shadow is shorter than you are, Get, stay out of the sun or get sun protection, but you can't make any vitamin D if your if your if your shadow is is uh, uh, longer than for, uh, higher than you. Um, so we have sort of the opposite shadow rule from the dermatologists in terms of making vitamin D. Now, in terms of foods which may pr um, produce maybe five ten percent of of vitamin D levels. Uh, fish, mainly mostly cold water ocean fish, and the best ones are those low on the food chain, which would be um, cold water salmon, um, wild salmon, not not farmed salmon, um, sardines, uh, anchovies, herring, uh, mackerel. Uh, it turns out that meat is also a very important source of vitamin D. Uh, that's in the form of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. There was a study reported from England in 2011 that uh, found that um, uh, uh, meat, meat eaters had the highest 25 hydroxyvitamin D concentrations, 
followed by fish eaters and much higher than vegetarians or vegans. There is an, uh, a 20 nan an eight nanogram per milliliter difference between the meat eaters and the vegans. So, um, so this means that um, depending on your, on your diet, you may have to look for other sources of, of vitamin D. Uh, the fortified foods such as milk and flour products are also available in some, some countries, but do, do not supply very much vitamin D. So this means that um, when, if you're not spending much time in the sun in the middle of the day, especially in the summer, you've got to rely on supplements. And there are two types. There's vitamin D3, colocalciferol, and vitamin D2, aerocalciferol. So vitamin D3 is the natural form of vitamin D, which is what we make in our skin. And that is the preferred type of vitamin D. And that's what most supplements are now that you buy uh, uh, in the vitamin shop or, or, or in, the, in, the, in the grocery store. Uh, vitamin D2 is made in yeast or, or, or fungi, and um, it has been patented and can be sold uh, through, through pharmacies. And so physicians often recommend vitamin D2 because uh, they can go to the pharmacy and the, the, the the uh, patients don't have to pay for it. However, it's much more expensive than vitamin D3, and it's not as effective. So um, we recommend vitamin D3. Now, um, it turns out that the skin has all the mechanisms for, for converting uh, the cholesterol to vitamin D3, from di vitamin D3 to 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and from there to calcitriol. Um, so, um, if you, um, are in the sun, um, you will eventually make, uh, enough, make vitamin D to help protect your skin. But th this is a study reported by dermatologists reporting that, um, t uh, supplementing with, uh, enough vitamin D to raise the 25 for vitamin D to above 40 or 50 nanograms per milliliter that's over 100 to 125 nanomoles per liter, would um, uh, be able to attenuate the inflammation from sunburn. And a, um, a colleague of mine who, whose wife is uh, has red hair and freckles told me that when she gets her 25 hydroxy vitamin D up to around 70 nanograms per milliliter, uh, she can go out in the sun in Illinois and spend an hour in the sun without any reddening without any burning. So, um, you know, of course, the dermatologists are recommending um, that you should take use sunscreen, um, but uh, the sunscreen has problems in that it primarily blocks the UVB, which produces vitamin D, and doesn't pr 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 reduce the, the pr transmission of the longer wave called UVA as much and it turns out that UVA is more responsible for melanoma than is UVB. So um, th th there's a problem with that. Also, the, the, nat the body's natural approach for, for reducing um, uh, uh, sunburn and, and, and cancer is to gradually tan throughout the season. Um, if one goes out every day, and spends a little time uh, in the sun um, as, as the spring and summer arrive, uh, one slowly builds up a, a tan that reduces the penetration of UVB by a factor of two to four. And that's generally enough to um, uh, protect the skin um, while one is in the sun. Now, the dermatologists uh, often point to the fact that melanoma is due to um, sun exposure. Well, if you look at the um, um, cancer statistics uh, for the United States for 2018, you see there are about 1.7 million new cancer cases and over 600,000 new cancer deaths. Uh, the, the melanoma to cancer cases is only 5%. The melanoma to uh, cancer deaths is 1.5%. And melanoma to all deaths is 0.35%. Um, so the 
UV, as I will show, UVB protects against many cancers. So the net benefit is, you do do a net benefit. You just have to be a little careful not to uh, sunburn and, and um, overexpose. Now, here's a um, chart showing how long it takes to produce uh, vitamin D as a function of latitude and, and season. So in the bottom, we go from uh, January through December uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And on the left, we go from latitude from the equator up to 90 degrees. On the right, the color scale starts with one minute. Uh, well, the black means it doesn't, it doesn't take much time at all. Uh, and the, the pink uh, means it takes about a minute. You get up to the uh, blue, it's uh, taking you know, maybe 12 minutes. So that's for 400 IUs of production with hands and face exposed for type 1 skin pigmentation. Now, uh, turns out that uh, uh, the pigmentation for many people uh, is much darker. Type 1 is very pale skin like in Northern Europe. Uh, type 5 is like in Africa. Um, type 3 might be Hispanic or, or Middle Eastern. Um, so um, people generally, um, people who've lived in an area for hundreds or thousands of years uh, generally have the skin pig pigmentations that's ideally suited for where they're living. Now, take Australia. The Aborigines who've been there for thousands of years have very dark skin. The, but as you rec can recall, many of the inhabitants of, of Australia were brought there as, as prisoners from, from the United Kingdom. And they have the, the Celtic skin, which is uh, very fair, freckled, red hair, and so on. And they have a different type of melanin than, than most people do. And their melanin, um, uh, I think called feel melanin, does not uh, tan very easily. And as a result, um, they are very sensitive to the uh, skin. And if they spend much time in the sun, they can easily burn. And so, so for years, the, the, um, the Cancer Society in Australia has, has been very cautious about um, uh, recommending sun exposure to, to Australians. And it got to the point where um, up until a few years ago, they had more or less convinced the, the Aust uh, Australian vitamin D researchers not to promote vitamin D uh, for fear that they would uh, uh, let the Australians spend more time in the sun and develop more skin cancer melanoma. They did outlaw uh, indoor tanning in Australia several years ago. And I think it's also very not very popular in the United States anymore. Um, so as I'll explain later, um, the while, while the skin... Uh, Pigmentation it can be ideally uh, suited for people living uh, uh, where their ancestors lived. If they move to another location, like well, like to Australia or to the United States, if they move to to where their skin is much darker than than the prevailing uh, skin uh, pigmentation, they uh, suffer. They can become vitamin D deficient. Um, now, there is a seasonal variation in 25-hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. 